wonderful adventure of living with Tom Myers. And one of the best parts of that adventure is, um, is getting to meet all the friends he had since he was here before I was and getting to know the people who were important with him, like Dave and Margaret and, um, and also Ted, who was uh, a, a high school classmate of, of Dave's, but also was there when Tom was there. So I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting Ted and, uh, and actually it was at an event Tom wasn't attending, but uh, it was an important event. And Ted, I found to be a fascinating person and a charming individual. And I'm so grateful that he is here to speak to our club today. Uh, just last Tuesday, he spoke at the Atlanta Rotary Club, so he's doing the Rotary Circuit now. Um, Ted is a journalist, an author, and a professor. He's written three nonfiction books, A Secret Gift, which is the one that Rick Bissler was referring to earlier, uh, and which I read and agree it's a fabulous book, uh, and it's set right in Canton, Ohio, so when you read that one, uh, you learn about the Depression, and you learn about some really um, impactful gifts that his grandfather made possible. A Nation of Secrets, The Threat to Democracy and the American Way of Life. That was in 2007. It was winner of the Goldsmith Book Award from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And he also wrote The Book of Honor, Covert Lies and Classified Debts at the CIA. That was in 2000. And um, it was a New York Times and Washington Post bestseller. He's a former investigative reporter and editor for that Washington Post, working under Bob Woodward. He later wrote and edited Time Magazine, covering Congress, the environment, and later serving Washington, serving as Washington investigative correspondent. For 18 years, he taught at Georgetown University, and he's written for a wide range of venues, including the Smithsonian, National Geographic, New York Times, Sports Illustrated, Slate, GQ, Mother Jones, I could go on and on. Um, in uh, 2016, Gupp was named a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study at Durham University in the, in the United Kingdom. And uh, in the spring of 2017, he returned to Durham, writer in residence, a position he has held semi-annually since then. He's lectured at John Hopkins and Brown and has been an invited speaker to Kent Rotary, Atlanta Rotary, the National Archives, Harvard, the University of London, and presidential libraries. Um, in the fall of 2021, I'm skipping stuff in here too. In the fall of 2021, he will teach the media and democracy, a class we should all be taking, uh, as the George R. Guthels Distinguished Visiting Professor of Leadership Studies at Williams College. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Ted Gupp. Welcome, Ted. And if you haven't already uh, taken your, uh, your camera off so we can see you, that would be great. Welcome, Ted. So let's see here. Is that it? Does that do it? That does it. Okay. Uh, well, wait a it minute. Says You're gone. Your face is gone again. Okay, let me try this again. There you are. Um, I'm there now. You can see me all right? Okay. Um, and can you hear me? All right, terrific. Well, first, um, I wanted to say thank you to, to Kathy for uh, extending the invitation these days. Any invitation is welcome, <laughs> especially from a dear friend. I wanted to send a special hello to. Uh, to David Hunter, my classmate. And I wanted to congratulate uh, the Rotary chapter for um, 100 years of service. That's quite an accomplishment. Um, I thought I would start by um, uh, speaking a little bit about um, the sources of satisfaction in my career. And then as all journalists do, morph into the negative. Um, but I'm gonna start with the positive and um, I have a lot of sources of satisfaction and gratification. Uh, but I thought that first I should just um, offer a short autobiographical note because I think that it will help you understand my motivations. Um, I am a classic mid-century baby. I was born um, in 1950 in Lima, Ohio. I grew up 
in the Midwest, in Ohio. I absorbed Midwest values. I listed uh, modesty, respect for others, a sense of proportionality. I suspect that, uh, that those are not uncommon where I grew up. Um, I grew up in the middle class, uh, starting off at sort of the lower middle class. And in later years, we, we ascended the ladder and reached some of the higher rungs, still well within the middle class. Um, I grew up in a traditional home. I said yes, sir, and no, ma'am, to my parents uh, in the house and elsewhere, which was a brutal habit to break as I became an adult male. Um, you know, the last thing in the world you want as a journalist is for people, reporters, to say yes, sir, and no, ma'am, to their sources and people in authority. Uh, it was a hard habit to break, but I did. Um, two other uh, autobiographical notes. I'm Jewish, and I grew up in a time uh, in Canton, Ohio, when I was, my family was not permitted to live where we wanted to. There were what were called restrictive covenants in uh, deeds, and they were enforceable in the courts, and they would not allow Jews or individuals of color to, to live in, a, in that uh, house or that community. Um, I incurred a good number of uh, slurs and bigotry and uh, could not belong to certain associations or clubs. Um, and then one other note I should make is that when I entered high school, and I don't know if David Hunter will remember this, but I was a shrimp. I was all of four foot nine inches tall and I weighed 79 pounds. Um, so uh, I was extremely vulnerable. And as a Jew at Western Reserve Academy, I was also marginalized from the get go. And I mention this uh, not as a, a pitch for sympathy, but because Throughout my life, I've identified with the marginalized in society, the voiceless, the excluded, the vulnerable. Um, so that's it about my background and upbringing. Um, the, the seminal event in my life as a journalist occurred, um, uh, well, in 1970, I applied as a sophomore in college to the Washington Post for an internship. Uh, I never read the Washington Post. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I found it on a, on a bulletin board at a career office in my college, um, and I was rejected. Um, but um, what I wrote, my essay caught the attention of the then executive editor, Ben Bradley, and we developed a correspondence that lasted over the course of seven years. And in 1977, um, I had lunch with him in Boston, and, um, we, we hit it off, um, and, and eventually, um, uh, I guess it was 77, um, I was told that I'd be getting a phone call from the Post telling me whether my application for employment was accepted. Uh, at the time, I was in law school at Case Western Reserve, and I was so excited about the call that I put on a suit to receive the phone call. Um, and it turns out that, um, that they made the mistake of hiring me, and I was, uh, I've been smiling ever since. Um, so let me try to just uh, share with you uh, some of my little mini adventures. Some of them have been very exhilarating. Some have been very challenging. Um, um, one of the things that I was able to do um, was to fly on Air Force One with two presidents, uh, Reagan and Bush One. Um, it, was, um, <laughs> it wasn't nearly as sexy as it sounds. Um, I learned some hard lessons on those flights. Uh, like I tried to tape record uh, interviews on the flight, uh, and the only thing that my tape recorder captured were the sound of the uh, the four Rolls Royce uh, jet engines. Um, so you know, I, I, I was a, a steep learning curve. Uh, other adventures: I tagged polar bears off the coast of Siberia. Um, that was exciting. The group that did it before me disappeared under the ice and was never found. Um, so I had to sign a series of waivers. Um, I spent months tracking the illegal trade in ivory, literally going around the world for several months. Um, that was exciting. I covered uh, martial law in China after the Tiananmen massacre in 89. Um, and um, when Reagan was shot, uh, I was assigned to uh, investigate and report on John Hinckley, the, uh, uh, the, the attempted uh, the, the, the assassin or would be assassin. Uh, I was sent out to background Sandra Day O'Connor when she was nominated for the Supreme Court as a justice. Um, one of the things I remember when I was reporting that I was with her, her then her husband, her late husband, 
and I was sitting in his office and he opened up a drawer and pulled out love letters she had sent to him when they were courting and he read me some some passages uh, he was discreet uh, and I wasn't allowed to repeat what he read but it was it gave me a good insight into Sandra Day O'Connor um, Let's see, I spent time with a, a possibly wide range of politicians. I just wrote down Barney Franks, uh, who was one of the first uh, openly gay members of Congress, Jesse Helms, um, who was uh, homophobic, uh, Robert Byrd from West Virginia, uh, former Speaker of the House, Carl Albert. Some of, some of you are old enough to remember these names. Uh, Carl Albert had a, had a, a taste for, for uh, whiskey. And I remember I, I went out to interview him in Oklahoma after he had retired. And we were weaving down a highway at a high rate of speed from one side of the road to the other. And I was saying a prayer. Um, he revealed to me in an interview out there that there was a time where he was next in line to be president when Nixon was facing impeachment. And it appeared he was going to be president. And he enlisted the help of Ted Sorensen who wrote uh, John F. Kennedy's inaugural address to write an inaugural address for him. And that address was in his safe in Oklahoma where it had been since the days of Watergate. And I persuaded him to share it with me and that produced a front page uh, story in the Washington Post. Uh, it was the inaugural address that was never given. I love stories like that, little footnotes to history. Um, a number of the stories that I did can be traced to childhood. When I was 11, I read John Hersey's Hiroshima scared the hell out of me um, and uh, and it really set me on a path to explore and investigate um, nuclear weapons nuclear war and what would happen and uh, three decades later I went to Hiroshima uh, for National Geographic and interviewed uh, dozens of Hibakusha the survivors of the A-bomb um, pretty much following in Hersey's footsteps that was for the 50th anniversary of the bombing. And then last year, Geographic called me again and asked me to go back for the 75th. I'm that old. Um, uh, and I went back. Most of the people I'd interviewed or, or had, had died. Um, but I interviewed uh, many, many uh, Hibakusha there. Um, when I first went, I was 44. When I returned, I was 68. Um, Hiroshima had changed as much as I had. Um, it was very much a modern city. Um, and and uh, in a very difficult situation, being across the straits from a nuclear-armed North Korea and um, a world that was bristling with nuclear weapons. Um, that story led me to the discovery that there were uh, many Americans in Hiroshima at the time the bomb was dropped. Uh, most were of Japanese-American descent, um, but they were Americans. And one of the fellows that I met was a guy named Howard Kakita, and I profiled him for the Washington Post uh, a few weeks ago. Um, remarkable guy. He was seven and a half years old when the bomb went off. He was standing on the roof of, of his home and um, the house collapsed. He was buried and dug himself out and, um, and he couldn't get back to his parents in the States um, until 1947 or eight because of Pearl Harbor and the fact that his parents had been interned in, a, in an American camp uh, as Japanese Americans. A long story, but a remarkable story and a remarkable guy. Um, my interest in the bomb led me to write about things like Mount Weather, the underground uh, retreat inside a mountain in Virginia where the president and his cabinet and Supreme Court justices would go in the event of a nuclear war. And uh, doing my reporting night, I met a gentleman named Bud Gallagher, um, one of the most interesting people I've ever met. These are sources of satisfaction in my career. Um, Bud was initially very reluctant to see me or speak with me. Um, he had a remarkable career. In World War II, he was a bomber, uh, flew a, was a pilot of a bomber and was shot down by the Germans, captured by the Gestapo and tortured in the, uh, in the dungeon of a castle. Uh, he managed to uh, survive after the war. He, he flew um, bombers that had nuclear weapons on them. Uh, and then he became the Air Force's principal source on uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical, chemical weapons. Uh, in, in the 19, early 1950s, he was a cloud sampler. That's not a common field. Uh, what he did was he flew in a small plane through the mushroom clouds of atomic blasts. 
and, and thermonuclear blasts in the Pacific. And he had a small X-ray plate attached to a string that he swallowed so that when he flew through these mushroom clouds and landed on the, on the deck of an aircraft carrier, they could pull the string out and determine how much radiation he'd been exposed to. Um, remarkable guy. And he went on to head Mount Weather, the presidential retreat. He and I became friends. I won't say close friends, but we became friends. I was with him the day before he died, went to his funeral at Arlington Cemetery, and, and uh, I'll never forget him. He's one of the many people that I met that um, left a lasting impression on me. A um, couple of other high points. One, um, every journalist, I think, dreams of getting an innocent, <coughs> excuse me, getting an innocent person out of jail. I had the good fortune of doing that with Maurice Williams in St. Louis. He was in for a string of armed robberies and facing scores of years of incarceration. Uh, I proved that he didn't do it. And, and what was more unusual is I found out who did and proved that he did. And he went to prison. And Maurice came out. And the day he came out, he went on the Today Show. Um, you know, but um, that's the kind of story that... Uh, the journalists live for to be able to get an innocent guy out of jail. And there are too many of them in there. Um, and I know this for a fact, it's not, you know, it's, they're just because of the disparate nature of our justice system, they're just too many innocent people in prison. Um, anyhow, uh, m most recently in recent years, I've, I've continued to report as I mentioned, but I also write essays sometimes for the New York Times or the Washington Post. Uh, I wrote a, a modern love column for the New York Times about how um, on a flight, uh, I was waiting for a flight to London, I was in the Boston airport and I met a woman at the legal seafood counter there, which changed my life. Um, and I wrote about that for uh, their modern love column. Uh, I wrote about why we should give Alabama a second chance. That's my family's ancestral home. Uh, I've written deeply personal stories about the loss of a son. Uh, I've written humorous pieces. Um, um, and I have, I think, a good bit to look forward to, even though I'm definitely slowing down. Um, you know, I, I have other columns, essays, and reported pieces I'd like to do, and I'd love to do another book um, if I could find the right subject. Now under frustrations. Fortunately, I didn't leave myself a lot of time for that because I don't like to bitch and moan too long. But the first one is a petty one. It's called bad editing. I hate bad editors and there are some. I'm not a prima donna. I, I don't resist uh, being edited uh, and having my work improved and I recognize it as flawed. But there are people that, out there that just weren't meant to be editors and, and that's one frustration. Uh, second frustration is, is being alone, being isolated. A lot of times, even though my reporting brings me in contact with people, my writing uh, is, is a source of isolation. I wrote a book about um, covert operatives of the CIA that died undercover. Uh, I interviewed their families um, and uh, read their letters home and, and, uh, and their identities were erased. And I, I sat with the families, the children, the parents, the, the spouses, the widows and all and, and, and watched them grieve as I told them what happened to their loved ones. Uh, but I never shed a tear. And then four years later, I began writing the book and I was sitting at my desk and I realized that the column around my, the, the, the collar around my shirt was soaking wet. It had wicked the tears that had been streaming down my cheek as I sat down to write. I just held it in for four years and then writing released it. Uh, but I also remember after those four years sitting down to write and singing to myself, I'm spending too much time alone, time alone, time alone. It was like a scene out of uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining, you know? Um, so that's, that's another source of frustration. Um, and then uh, there's another kind of being alone, which is a distinctly Washington phenomenon. Uh, when you're with the Washington Post or Time Magazine and, and you call someone, the door's open pretty much. They, they answer your calls. Um, you know, Washington is a city built upon affiliation. Uh, the, the question that everyone asks in Washington is who you're with. And if you can say the administration, the Congress, um, you know, the, the CIA, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, you're golden. But if you're not with them, if you're a freelance writer or a book author, as I've been for many years, it's different. And when I first went out on my own after being with the, with the Post and Time, and they'd ask me, who are you with? I'd look around the room and I wouldn't see anybody. And I'd feel like being a smart ass and saying I'm all by myself. But of course, I didn't say that. And I would recite something of my resume to try to get my bona fides established. Another source of, 
of frustration is brevity. Um, we're moving increasingly to shorter and shorter stories. And, you know, it's less is more. I get that. I understand that. But there's a certain point of the threshold that you cross where your stories get so short that they become distortions. They leave out the nuance, the conflict, the three dimensionality. And this creates a distortion of reality and it feeds into the nation's polarization. Uh, and it suggests that problems that are very complicated are simpler than they really are. Uh, so excessive brevity is something that's a problem and a source of frustration for me. Also, what I would call the nichification of publications. That is, people read what is confirming of their bias. And so you're not writing for the general audience so much anymore. And I think that's the shame. Uh, and that also feeds into polarization. Um, almost done, I have two minutes. Um, so another source of frustration is the demise of objectivity. And no, we were never objective. But yes, we pursued objectivity and that pursuit was noble. And I think to a significant degree, we've abandoned that. Um, you know, and um, you know, the laughing, the joking, the tears, the snide remarks, the cleavage, the verbal cuts, uh, I think they've all compromised journalism and eroded its credibility. I, I don't like Don Lemon's tears. I don't like Chris Cuomo's anger. I don't like Rachel Maddow rolling her eyes in disgust. I don't like the smugness of Sean Hannity. I think these are all unprofessional, um, but then I'm old school. And then a final disappointment is that when I was cutting my teeth in the field when I was younger, um, I thought that I was changing the world. Um, now, uh, that my beard has grown gray, uh, I realized that I didn't change the world. I momentarily changed some people's lives. I might have very briefly changed the direction or course of a particular piece of legislation or an action or something, but ultimately history is cyclical. And I've lived long enough now to see the reforms erased and diluted like the post-Watergate reforms, campaign and election reforms, um, the reform of the CIA, the War Powers Act, the Voting Rights Act, they've all undergone mutations. And, and so really in a sense, what we do in journalism is more like what an oncologist does with cancer and that if it can't be removed, the best we can hope for is remission and containment. And that's kind of what we hope for in, in writing about um, corruption or when we go off the rails as a country. Um, I, I flunked French as a student. Um, um, so forgive me when I say this phrase, plus ça change, plus la même chose, which is the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that's certainly one of the lessons I've learned. But finally, I am glad that there are younger journalists behind me coming up through the ranks that have not learned the disabling lesson um, uh, that history is cyclical. Um, because it would sap them of their energy and their aspirations and we would be in a worse place. Uh, I think there is a place for, for those of us uh, who are long in the teeth and, and experience, but uh, we need to move over because if you truly believe that, that history is cyclical, um, then it, it, um, it removes the incentive for tackling the system and, and you need to come at it fresh. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, there's a wonderful new generation of journalists behind me. Uh, they're writing remarkable things. And uh, so that's restorative of my hope. Okay, so that's it. I've exhausted my time. And, and, and as I told Kathy, what I look forward to is hearing from you. So let's do that now. So uh, we're open for questions. So Tom's waving his hand. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, Ted, Tom Myers, uh, good to see you again. Um, I guess you've talked about uh, okay. uh, journalism. You talked about journalism quite a bit, and I'd I'd be interested to know who your top two or three journalists are, the people that you admire the most today, who are writing. Um, so. As you know, journalism has many different forms. So they're columnists, they're reporters. I mean, in, in the area of reporting, I certainly have a lot of respect for Jane Mayer at The New Yorker. I think she's remarkable. Uh, David Fahrenholt at The New York Times, I mean, at uh, The Washington Post. Um, um, let's see. Um, of columnists, um, uh, I really like 
uh, people like uh, David Brooks, who's um, something of a conservative, but but uh, yeah, like coming through at all. Uh, you know, an independent. Can you still hear me? Yes. Um, um, you know, and then there's some old workhorses. Bob Woodward is is still doing remarkable work. He's my boss. I admit I'm biased, but I don't know of anyone who has produced as many significant works as he has. Um, you know, I think more less in terms of individuals and more in terms of publications. I think in terms of the New Yorker. Uh, the Washington Post, um, the um, the New York Times, um, independent sites like ProPublica uh, are doing uh, fantastic work. Um, there's a lot of good journalism, but there's a lot less of it because the budgets have been cut, the staffs have been cut, and because the government uh, no longer feels any responsibility to respond to journalist inquiries in many cases. Are there any other questions? I know uh, Dave Hunter, I think, was um, trying to ask. I don't know, his, his uh, seemed a little garbled. Margaret, can you help him out? <laughs> David, you're completely garbled. I apologize for this feel up here. Hey, David, you might be able to put the question in the uh, chat and then maybe you could answer it that way if we can't hear you. In the meantime, Kathy, I have a quick question. Sure, go Kurt. Um, so Ted, thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, sorry. Uh, I have a quick question about your editor comment. Could you, could you explain that a little bit more about how your first frustration was editors? It, it, was it over editing or just uh, taking over your work or? Maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Um, yeah, as I say, I'm actually quite flexible, and I and I only want my work to be the best it can be. So I, I really uh, welcome good editing, and I don't mind. I don't even mind having a piece be restructured if it needs it, you know, because because my work is not perfect, and I see that some some things that I do are really terrific, and some things need a lot of help and intervention, and I, and I'm well aware of that. What I what I don't like is when editors uh, insert cliches, when, when they take out material which is quintessential to understanding the circumstances I'm describing, um, when they introduce bias with a particular word. Um, those are the sorts of things. I mean, it, it has to do from my vantage point, and I, you know, I elevate it to a level that maybe is presumptuous and offensive, but I, I link those kinds of things to an issues of integrity, journalistic integrity. Um, now, there's also the aesthetic. I mean, uh, you know, there's a common phrase in journalism, murder your darlings. A lot of times you have to kill the phrases that sound the best because they don't have much meaning or they create unwanted ambiguity and stuff. But, but um, you know, I would say three quarters of the editors have had in my life been very good. Um, they've been respectful of me. I've been respectful of them. A quarter of them, not so much. Uh, I once had a terrible book editor. Oh, that was a dreadful experience. Um, but. Um, uh, you know, I just believe in mutual respect uh, in that relationship. And, and I think that, you know, if I've worked with, say, 50 editors in my life, I think 45 of them would tell you that I was uh, a breeze to work with, you know, that I, that I, you know, I wasn't huffy, I wasn't defensive. There are probably five out there that, that feel about me the way I feel about them, which is best not to work together again. Great. And I've got a question for you. Over the years, who's the most interesting character you've encountered in your work? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, the most interesting character I've encountered in my work. Hmm. Um, I think, I think that it would probably be one or two of the fellows that I wrote about that, that died working undercover for the CIA. I think that um, there was um, um, uh, 
there were a couple of, of fellows who were just extraordinary in terms of their sacrifice and in terms of their intelligence and commitment. And, and uh, these are people that I never met because they, they were dead, but I got to know a lot about them through their families and their letters and their journals and whatever I, I could discover about them. Um, aside from them, um, you know, to be honest with you, I think that some of my colleagues have been the most exciting and memorable people I've met in the field of journalism and no one more so than Ben Bradley. Uh, he was my mentor, my executive editor of the Post and probably the greatest um, newspaper editor of the 20th century, um, certainly the most courageous. And I had the privilege, we, those of us that worked with him and for him, thought of ourselves sort of like the Knights of the Round Table. You know, it was like, you know, we, we, we were really privileged to, to be working for King Arthur. That's kind of how we felt. Great. Dave Hunter, did you want to ask something? Now that my skillful technician has got me in the right <laughs> place, I appreciate that. I, uh, I, I would start off by saying that Ted, Ted identified some of the Midwestern characteristics that uh, he's, under, he's, his, he's taken on, if you will. And I think he's, he's, um, he's correct. He, he, he has all of those characteristics. One that maybe has too heavy a dosage on is modesty. Because I can tell you as one of his classmates, he was one of the, the top students uh, in, in our class at Western Reserve Academy. And you had to be in the upper stratosphere to be able to do that. Um, in preparation for today, uh, I had a chance to go back and look because I needed to refresh my recollection on when Ted was the speaker at Akron Roundtable. And I tried to take a guess how long ago it was, but it was actually 19 years ago this month. And uh, I played a role in that. I think, uh, I can't recall if I introduced Ted or handled the Q&A, but I can tell you I, from my seat on the podium, the audience was just riveted by his address because it was shortly after he completed his book about the CIA, which was really opened the door and offered a viewpoint into that agency that really hadn't previously been exposed. And uh, uh, so I have two questions I'd like to direct to, to my classmate and my good friend, Ted. One is, can he identify the one or two uh, masters, that's what we called them back in the day, at Reserve who uh, helped uh, ignite his interest in writing and made him the terrific writer he is today. And then I'd also like him to comment on how he views the current state of journalism now and what he thinks uh, it will look like five to 10 years from now. So with that, Ted, I'll let you take it away. It's a pleasure to hear your voice and see you. Let me start that way. And I, just to correct the record, because I don't like, um, I think that every journalist needs to be open to corrections. Um, I was not an extraordinary student at Western Reserve Academy. And in fact, I have a letter from a very senior ranking person at the Academy to my parents suggesting I be withdrawn because I didn't have the innate ability or or talent or intelligence to, to, to get through the school. So I just needed to correct the record. I thank you for the, for the, the high praise, but unwarranted those years I was there. Um, so there are two, there are two uh, faculty members that come to mind um, that I feel indebted to. Um, actually, the three, Eleanor Roundy was one. She was my English teacher. Uh, my senior year, and she was the first one that gave me any sign or hint of encouragement that, that helped me to believe in myself. And she allowed me to write poetry instead of prose for a number of assignments, and she critiqued them. And, you know, just the idea that she took me seriously was such a breath of fresh air. So that's one person. Max Laborde uh, is another who I did not like. Um, he was a strict disciplinarian and grammarian, but he, he really did help me to appreciate the structure of language and the precision of, of words, so I owe him. And then finally, uh, Frank Longstreth, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't include him. On a personal level, um, you know, <laughs> I can only say that, that 
he didn't take me too seriously and he didn't take himself too seriously. And, and his, his attitude helped me get through it. And I'll just tell you very briefly that um, uh, I went away on, on vacation. I was taking uh, Latin four with him. I was the only one in the class and he was kind enough to, to offer it to me. And I was the only one. And I came back from vacation. Um, I was incredibly naive and sheltered. <laughs> I came back and I walked into class and his first word. So that was Frank. And uh, I, I always so wait appreciated a minute, Ted? his... Uh, Ted? Time yes. out. I don't know if you garbled at that moment for everyone else, but at that moment, you, so you said the first words out of his mouth were, and then I garbled. So would you repeat that? First words out of his mouth were, hey, Gup, did you get any? <laughs> which, which will forever endear me to him. Um, anyhow, the second question about journalism now and five to 10 years from now, I think it's going to continue to evolve in terms of um, technology and multi-platform storytelling. Um, my fear is that it will continue to evolve in the direction of kind of confirming individual bias and prejudice and ideological positioning. That would be a tragedy because the role of journalism going back all the way to de Tocqueville in the 1840s in this country, French visitor was that journalism provided a common set of facts so that we could reach compromise, we could govern, we could agree on certain basic things. Our principles could, could vary, but if we had a foundation of facts, we could progress. Now we're in paralysis because we don't share common facts. And I, I fear that the part of that is that some people glom onto Fox, some glom onto MSNBC. We don't have enough in common to, to take one step forward. And if that progresses further, then I think the Republic is in, is in dire, dire straits. And I, I'm praying that that, that won't be the case. Um, um, you know, there's a thing that the Washington Post puts over the mast, under the masthead of, of the paper. It says, democracy dies in darkness, which suggests that, that, that people who are ignorant, um, that, that that's one of the, the uh, underlying causes uh, for democracy to die. And um, actually not that, belief. I, I, I think that, that, that people can be informed and arrive at very different conclusions and demonize each other, and that that can cause the demise of democracy as well. But we gotta, we've got to at least strive for some kind of common set of facts. Absent that, I think we're, we're really doomed. And, and uh, I, I'm not going to end on a pessimistic note. I, I think that there are enough talented journalists out there and enough, enough well-intentioned uh, citizens in this country who see what's happening to us and what we're doing to ourselves, uh, that I believe that we will find a way out of this, but I, I fear that it might be a while. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, uh, at the, for the Kent Rotary, we have, uh, would you be able to stay after the meeting for people who can stay, Ted? Sure. Okay, great, because I think there are more questions. Uh, so. Uh, one of the customs at Kent Rotary is that we always have a responder to our programs. And today's responder, responder is uh, the director of the Kent Library, Kent Free Library, Stacy Richardson. Stacy? Can you hear me? There she is. Can you hear me? Yep. Ted, thank you for joining us today. Um, in today's current climate of fake news and cancel culture, and when people are apt to believe that science isn't real, um, it's more important now than ever to have journalists and authors dedicated to and willing to share information with the American people and to make information accessible. Uh, your commitment and the commitment of others in your profession is appreciated, um, especially right now uh, at a time when our country seems so divided. Um, I hope that your talk will inspire Rotarians and others to read, to learn, to understand, to seek truth, and to use that knowledge and their critical thinking skills for good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I uh, thank you very much. I'm going to end this meeting.